Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we are talking everything true crime. We talk about every single red flag we see. We talk about current cases, old cases, conspiracy cases. We really talk about everything. So if you've never checked out this channel before, first of all, what the heck have you been doing? Um, no, but second of all, I really hope you enjoy um, the channel and appreciate today's case coverage and consider supporting us by just hitting that subscribe button. It's free and it is a quick way to show support, as is just smashing that like button really quick because you gotta have faith that you're gonna like this video. I've got faith in it. But for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. As always, I am so happy to have you here with me today. Today's case is an older case that has recently started to get its justice. It's a case that deals with two countries across the world from each other, and a love triangle, greed, lies, infidelity, I mean, the works. It has got everything that we have come to know about true crime, things that we have seen on Dateline 2020. I mean, it is one of those jam-packed cases. And it's the case of Lawrence and Bianca Rudolph. And guys, this one has got a lot of twists and turns, so buckle up and let's jump right in. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. We are going to take a quick break in today's case video to have a word from our sponsor. All right, guys, spooky season is officially among us. I actually have already set up the Halloween decorations in my house, which you can see via my Instagram, and I set those up actually the last week of August, which I'm embarrassed to say, but like I am ready for spooky season. And for me, the best part about it is cuddling up when it's dark outside, when it starts to get cold, lighting a fire, and watching documentaries and true crime documentaries particularly. That's my jam, that's what I like. Now. I feel like I have tapped into every single resource possible and that I am running out of stuff to binge, but luckily Magellan has got my back. You guys have heard me talk about Magellan before. I'm talking to you about them today, guys, because they are absolutely incredible. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service with over 3,000 documentaries available to stream, and they have documentaries in every type of genre that you could possibly think about. They have space, history, True crime, which you know I love my true crime. I mean, they've got it all. And they are adding new releases every single week, between 15 to 20 hours of new content, for which I love because that means that we will never run out of something to binge, especially during this like binge-worthy spooky season that's among us. And the best part about Magellan is you can stream from anywhere on any device. Whether you're at home, you're cuddled up with a blanket, you're waiting in the parking lot for your friend who's, you know, inside at a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment, you're waiting in line at one of the long Disneyland rides during Halloween, which are like literally upwards of 90 minutes, wherever you are, you can stream Magellan. Just pop your AirPods in or don't, who cares, and watch whatever stands out to you the most. As I was researching today's case, I was actually watching Magellan simultaneously because there is a new one that I have been wanting to watch that I added to my queue called Murdered on Honeymoon. And coincidentally, it kind of ties in with today's case, so I guess it works out perfectly. But anyways, that documentary is just absolutely fascinating. It's about a newlywed who just started her honeymoon in Cape Town when she was then kidnapped and murdered. And the link directly to that documentary is in my description and also the link to sign up for Magellan, which you heard that right because Magellan is offering you guys, all you tend to lifers, a free month-long trial, which is perfect. All you have to do is go to that link in the description box. I'm telling you, if you haven't tried Magellan guys yet, do it. Thank me later. You are going to be obsessed. In a time in which we are going to want to just be binging all of the things, you are going to have so much great content thanks to Magellan. So check them out. You get a free month. Oh my god, they're amazing. They're an amazing partner of this channel. I can't speak highly enough about them. So thank you, Magellan, for sponsoring today's video, for being a great partner, and for offering all of my 10 to lifers a free month-long trial. I cannot wait to continue binging. I think I might even actually like break out and start watching some of the space documentaries just because I'm kind of fascinated. I feel like it's like healthy for my brain. I should just like get out of crime for one second. <laughs> so I'll keep you updated on that. All right, guys, and thank you so much for all of this understanding that sponsors are essential to the channel if we want to grow it to a place where I can deliver you more true crime all the time. Now let's jump right into today's case. Bianca and Larry Rudolph met while Larry was in dental school and Bianca was at the University of Pennsylvania. They quickly fell in love and got married in 1982, right after he finished dental school. 
all was right in their world, and they raised two children, Anna and Julian, and were just living a fantastic love story. Larry opened up a dental practice called Three Rivers Dental in Pennsylvania, and his dental practice, quickly becoming successful, started out opening up multiple branches. But when he wasn't working, the two of them spent lots of time hunting for big game, which big game means animals that are larger than rabbits and squirrels. You know, think like tigers, lions, elephants, things like that. And the two of them visited many countries and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on these hunting trips. It was something that was very important to the two of them. Well, in 2012, Larry and Bianca moved to Arizona, so Larry traveled back and forth from Pennsylvania to Arizona for work, but by then, he had other doctors working for him in the practice that could do most of the work, so he would kind of just go back and forth checking in. And by 2016, they had five branches and were worth an estimated $10 million. Commercials were a huge strategy and thing that they did for their marketing, and that's really how they got the majority of their clients. What does a combat veteran firemen, police officer, and a working mom all have in common? They were all my patients, and just like you, they were afraid to visit the dentist. At Three Rivers Dental, we'll help you overcome your fears. You can have all your dental work done in one visit while you sleep, so don't put this off any longer. You're not alone. Find out why going to the dentist has never been so easy at Three Rivers Dental. Everybody loved Dr. Rudolph. Well, the patients loved Dr. Rudolph, at least, because patient reviews painted a picture of a kind, genuine dentist who went above and beyond for his patients. However, employee reviews were a little bit different. Many employees said that their days were long, with no breaks, and constantly were being reprimanded and scrutinized. But nonetheless, clients or prospective clients aren't really looking at how employees feel or employee reviews when finding a dentist. They're cruising on Yelp. They're not going on Glassdoor. They're mostly looking at the patient reviews, which by all accounts looked great and had amassed over 100,000 patients. Or so it said. So with Larry and Bianca's shared love for hunting, the two of them decided to take a hunting trip from September 27th, 2016 to October 11th, 2016 to Zambia. Zambia was a place that they had gone many times prior, but this trip was different, and this one was important. The sole focus of this trip was to let Bianca have the opportunity to hunt a leopard, which was a very big goal of hers. So Larry wasn't planning on hunting this trip, so he didn't get the license to hunt. Instead, his goal was to support Bianca in her efforts. So they headed to Zambia on September 27th with two guns in tow. The two guns were a Remington 375 rifle and a 12-gauge Browning shotgun. They stayed in a one-bedroom cabin near the Cafu River, and it was a place that they had stayed at before, and not only just stayed at, but also had an alleged crocodile attack at. Now, let's quickly talk about this attack, and then we'll come back to this trip. So in 2006, Larry went to stay at the cabins in Cafio. Now, allegedly, he decided to go fishing alone at sunrise, but he says that what happened next was something that made his career much harder for him, and really life-changing. Larry says that he was bringing a fish in that he had caught, but when he reached for it, a crocodile grabbed him and pulled him in. He said that the crocodile bit his thumb but that he was able to get to a rock and then fire his gun for help. But the medic said that Larry appeared quite calm for a crocodile attack and that his pants were just damp, which is odd considering he said that he was pulled all the way in by this crocodile. He had a few scrapes and cuts, but also nothing major. However, once he was back in the U.S., he reached out to an attorney about getting disability payments. He ended up making about $30,000 per month on disability, but was still working, making other money with his dental practice, despite that legally he was not supposed to be working if he was collecting this disability. He collected around $3.5 million of insurance money as well, claiming that it destroyed his career. Now, clearly it didn't, considering that he was still working, but many people who know him also don't think that he was actually attacked by a crocodile. They think that he actually ripped his own thumb by himself in an effort to get money, which to me seems like the first sign of a very financially greedy person willing to risk it all for money. So now let's go back to this 2016 trip to Zambia. 
The trip seemingly was going well. A witness said that Larry was very attentive to Bianca's needs throughout the entire trip. One night, apparently they even danced to Simply the Best by Tina Turner while they were outside just looking at each other, glowing and in love. They looked like a happy and in love couple. On that trip, Bianca never was able to shoot that leopard as she had hoped for. However, she did get a zebra, so apparently a little bit of a win. She was asked if she wanted to extend her trip, but she said no because her nephew was getting married four days after they were due back. She's a very close-knit Italian family and would never miss an event like that. But what she didn't know was that she would never make it back for that wedding, regardless of if she wanted to stay or not. On the morning of the 11th, Larry and Bianca were packing up to head home when employees from the cabins heard a loud gunshot. When they rushed over to see what was going on, Larry was lying over Bianca's body. A witness said he was yelling, my wife has just taken her life over and over again. Bianca was lying by a dresser and someone immediately went to get a medical kit. There was a hole in her black t-shirt and her bra. The bullet had hit the left side of her heart. In a flash, her life was over and it was too late to save her at this point. So Larry yelled, what am I going to tell my kids? And even tried to throw himself into the river at one point, but was stopped by an employee. So was this a display of dramatics? or a genuinely distraught husband and father. What happened next is a very, very strange series of events, to put it mildly. As investigations continued, stories were just not adding up. Initially, Larry had told the tour guide, who ran into the cabin, that he was taking a shower when this all went down. However, he had full clothes on, including shoes, and he wasn't wet at all, which seems very odd that within 30 seconds, the snap of your fingers, he could dry off, get dressed, throw on his shoes, and be hovering over his wife's lifeless body. And Larry told another guide that he was in the bathroom with, quote-unquote, the shits. I mean, gross, if you're going to lie, at least, like, lie about something that's not so gross. So, But two different stories. So which one was it? They're two very different scenarios. But coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, both scenarios were removing him from the actual scene of her death. In fact, that same guide, Mark, says that he and Larry were discussing theories on whether Bianca's death may have been accidental while they were on the way to alert police of her death. Whereas, remember, his initial outcry was that she did this intentionally. Because now Larry's claim was that she was packing the gun and that's when she shot herself. Some of the theories included her long acrylic nails and could they have accidentally hit the trigger while packing the gun or that maybe the zipper got stuck and she possibly slammed the butt of the gun down and it was a misfire. In any event, 11 hours after Bianca died, Larry was already calling the U.S. Embassy to figure out how he could cremate her body. He was wanting her cremated as soon as he possibly could. However, Bianca was actually very against being cremated. She was a practicing Catholic, and she believed that it was not right to have a cremation. She even had discussed that with her friends. But of course, Larry didn't care about that. He said it was apparently too difficult to take her body back to the States. So was it really too difficult? Or was it that he was trying to destroy evidence and avoid an autopsy being performed? Because remember those pictures of the big animals that they had shot and killed? He never had any problem getting those back to the United States, yet this time it was too difficult to take his wife home? The consular chief on the other end of the phone was beginning to get increasingly bad vibes over this. In Zambia, a body cannot be cremated before the funeral home receives the report from the forensic pathologist. Typically, this takes a few days or sometimes even longer. However, quickly after all of this, the funeral home alerted the chief, saying that they would be cremating her the very next day. The chief, taking all of the timing into account, realized this was so incredibly fast and that there had to be something more going on here. So he tipped off the FBI, and thank goodness he did so. Not only did he tip off the FBI, but he and two other people decided to go to the funeral home to take photos and preserve evidence for any potential crimes that could have been committed. The chief had actually been a longtime Marine and knew from past experience that something here just was not lining up. The first thing that he noticed was that the gunshot was directly on the heart. Another thing was that there was no evidence of gas burn or tissue expansion. Now, those typically happen when a gun is directly on the body when fired. In other words, when you're taking your own life or something happens in very close proximity, you're going to see that happen. There was also another wound from the weighting of the gun. So all of that led him to believe that the gun was not directly on Bianca and that this was a shot from close proximity, but not intentionally done on her own. 
From his experience, he believed that she was shot from about six to eight feet away, which wouldn't make sense if she had shot herself, accidental. Or so when Larry found out that the chief and others went to take photos and investigate, he went absolutely ballistic and actually called the chief. He was freaking out, saying that this was an invasion of privacy, and he wouldn't stop talking about the Privacy Act. Now, for someone who is so worried and so confused about what happened to his wife, he sure was freaking out over the wrong thing here. The investigation would be to give him answers, but clearly, he didn't need the answers from them. He probably knew the answers, and he didn't want them to find out the answers. So during that discussion with the chief, the chief asked Larry if he would like him to notify their children. And what Larry said next was very bizarre. He said no, and that he would notify them. But he also noted that the children were from a previous marriage. But here's the thing. Larry never had a previous marriage. Those two kids were he and Bianca's kids. So what on earth could be the reason for him to lie about that? To think that if the investigators talked to his children, they would potentially try to pry into his life, and maybe he was potentially hiding more skeletons in his closet? He also told them that he didn't know anything about the gun that took Bianca's life. But the gun was his gun. Again, very strange. Now, hours after that phone call, Anna, their daughter, who had started working at the dental practice, began freaking out at work because neither she nor her brother could get a hold of their mom, Bianca. And this was highly unlike her, especially since she should have already been home by then. Now, Larry didn't tell his children for a week about their mother's death for a week and he was very vague when he did in fact end up telling them anna was of course very confused about why her mom was cremated when she was catholic but she was just told by her father it's in the will but was it or was she just being told something by her father to shut her up and to satisfy her as she had been actually told to do so before which we're about to get into Two weeks after everyone was made aware of Bianca's deaths, one of Bianca's closest friends contacted the FBI. This is the same friend that Bianca had discussed not approving of cremation with. This friend told the FBI that Larry and Bianca had a very rough relationship. Allegedly, there was verbal altercations at times, fights about money, threats of divorce, and multiple affairs. And at the time of Bianca's murder, Larry was having an affair with none other than his former hygienist from his office. But this affair was weird, guys. It had been going on for 15 to 20 years. It was known in the office, and Larry knew that Bianca knew, but that she would never leave him due to her religious beliefs. Most of the staff also knew about it, but everyone just put up with it and shut up because they didn't want to risk losing their jobs. Lori Milliron is the name of the lady that Larry was having this affair with. The two of them went on many vacations together as well, spanning around 60 days per year between 2003 and 2008. They went to destinations including Cabo, Africa, Paris, New Zealand, and so many more. It's just absolutely disgusting. Exploiting your wife's religious beliefs and using them against her, knowing she won't leave you, and then prancing around on vacations with your mistress for nearly two decades. Not only is that just cruel, but it's absolutely disgusting. Now, Larry was elected president of the International Safari Club in 2009, but was actually resigned after his infidelity came up. Except, all of that infidelity wasn't with Mistress Lori. It was also with another woman that he had met through the International Safari Club back in 2011. And he would text this woman things like, you need some attention and lots of sex. How can you resist this? Just weird, gross things. And when the lady asked him about being married, being the absolute piece of trash steaming pile of garbage that he was, he told her how he had two homes, one in Pennsylvania and one in Arizona. And he said having two homes helped him keep his infidelity on the down low. Larry took that woman to dinner and drinks and eventually admitted to kissing her. But it all came to a head in May of 2011, and then he resigned a few months later in August. So Lori had gone to many events with him, and many people knew that she was also part of the problem. But Bianca pushed back. It's clear that she was ashamed as she was fighting and trying to say that she was in a happy marriage and that the affair was not happening, just in denial. But doing that only fueled the fire and allowed Larry to continue on his massive path of destruction. 
Fast forward to the summer of 2015. Larry asked his Hispanic contractor, hey, do you have any cousins or amigos in Mexico that can come up here and make somebody disappear? And guys, that is a direct quote. I'm not putting those words in myself. This is what this creep ass said. So the contractor who goes by Amos said he didn't know of anybody. Larry then showed him $25,000 as a commission. Obviously, such a weird series of events, but why would he do that? Where did that come from? Who needed to disappear? Well, a former manager of Larry's dental practice can explain that one. Her name is Anna Grimley. She had just moved into town for the new position at the office during the summer of 2015. So Lori came over to Anna's with a bottle of wine to help her set up a dresser. But Anna got a whole lot more from that visit than just a dresser. Allegedly, Lori proceeded to tell her about the affair and explained how Larry had been giving her tons of money. They were supposed to use that money to up and leave together, but that never happened. And allegedly, Lori told Anna that that's when she decided to give Larry an ultimatum. The ultimatum being that he had one year to get rid of Bianca. So then he reaches out to the contractor, asks him if he knows how to make anybody disappear, and he's trying to put his plan in motion. Then... In May of 2016, the time is almost up, and it happened to also be the same time when Bianca found another woman's hair in her bed, and that hair was none other than Lori's. Bianca told Larry's assistant that she was thinking about divorce, finally, after all this time. And she confronted Larry about the divorce and about the affair, but he denied it, so she showed him the emails proving it. He told her he would end things. He would end things with Lori and they would be okay. Two months later in July, Bianca said that understanding and forgiveness is required for a long-term marriage. And that's when they started to plan this Africa trip. So was this trip just one of their regular excursions or was this trip planned as a ruse to show Bianca that they were moving forward in a positive direction with their marriage and that he was leaving all of his infidelities and indiscretions behind them? Well, regardless of the reasoning behind the trip together, there was one problem. Things never actually ended with Lori. In fact, just a day after Bianca's funeral, Larry bought Lori a ticket to visit him, although he quickly canceled the reservation, probably realizing that he was going to look bad and get caught up and trip himself up. But the very next day, Lori bought a ticket to Vegas, and the two of them met there. They spent all of their time watching and tweeting about the 2016 election, having absolutely no idea that the FBI was starting to become very suspicious of the circumstances. Not only were they doing that, but Larry was filing life insurance claims, left and right. By spring of 2017, he had filed under nine different policies for life insurance and accidental death claims. He even went so far as to FedEx documents for one of them. Now, unfortunately, there wasn't enough information to not accept the claims and pay them. So that's what the companies did. And the FBI realized that less than six months prior to Bianca's death, they had actually set up a survivor's trust. One more sign that this was premeditated and planned out. In total, Larry collected $4,877,000. In summer of 2017, Larry put some of that money to use by purchasing land for $3.5 million to build a custom home for Mistress Lori. The two's relationship continued, with them gallivanting around as if nothing ever had happened. Although, when out sometimes, Lori apparently would notice certain people looking at them and was always worried that it was the FBI. Well, in 2020, things really took a turn. Now, Lori denies that this ever happened, but a bartender claims that she witnessed an argument between the two of them. During that fight, she apparently heard Lori yell, I killed my effing wife for you. Larry claims that he said, the FBI thinks I killed my effing wife for you. Now, behind the scenes, the FBI were conducting insane amounts of testing to prove that Larry was responsible for the death of Bianca. Remember, Bianca was cremated, so they were unable to measure her arms next to the gun to see if that was actually plausible. But they had that same friend who tipped them off help them. They took a photo that she had of she and Bianca and used that. They had the friend wear that same dress and took measurements and then compared it with the photo. They were able to get approximate arm sizes by using that. Then they had a study with a bunch of women with the same size arms. They had the women hold the gun a certain way, try to zip up the bag a certain way, and almost all of the things you could possibly think of. And most of the things that they asked these women to do, they were unable to do. 
They even recreated it 100 times, that exact gun bag that Bianca was allegedly loading when the gun went off. During that study, they could not find a possible way where Bianca would have been the one discharging the gun. Also, the way Larry claims her death happened would mean that she went directly against all gun safety rules. Given that she was an avid hunter, that just would not make sense. They also conducted interviews with all of the witnesses. They found a witness that directly saw him empty the gun the night before at the end of their hunting session. So why would the gun be reloaded if they weren't planning on using it and they were just packing up to go home? So finally, the FBI had enough information to piece it all together. On December 21st, 2021, while en route on a flight to Cabo, the feds hopped aboard. They sat quietly during the whole flight, and after landing, they arrested Larry, yelling, we got him. Later, Lori said that they were betrayed by their own government and that it was a witch hunt, somehow making herself the victim in all of this, as though they are the ones who were betrayed in this entire scenario. I mean, it's just the most narcissistic and absolute soulless response you could have in that moment. Larry was charged with foreign murder and mail fraud of seven life insurers. He pled not guilty. A month later, which would be January of this year, the feds showed up at Lori's house. They wanted to know all about those deposits Larry put in her account and that bar argument, as well as the alleged ultimatum. Lori said that the payments were because he was generous, not because of their relationship. She also lied about the bar argument. Ultimately, they arrested her and charged her with five counts of lying under oath one for obstructing justice, and another for accessory to murder. She, too, pled not guilty. So the two of them had a joint trial in July of this year, with Larry's children sitting on his side supporting him. And I don't want to get too much into the details of that, because we have seen similar situations, regardless what you believe, in the Barry Morphew and Suzanne Morphew case, where their two daughters have sat in Barry's corner with his defense advocating for his innocence. Many people believe it's because children are so desperate to still have one parent in their life that their mind can't actually even acknowledge the idea of their parent being involved in such a crime, while there are, of course, other circumstances in which children and siblings truly do believe that their parent is innocent. So we don't know which side of this is on, but in any event, they were sitting in his defense. The trial has started for Larry Rudolph of Paradise Valley. He's accused of murdering his wife on an African safari trip. This was back in 2016. He's facing murder and mail fraud charges for collecting millions of dollars in life insurance money. And now his alleged mistress is facing charges too. True Crime Arizona's Brianna Whitney has been investigating this case since January and went through a lot of federal documents today. What'd you find out? Hundreds of pages of documents. This is a wild case we've got going on and we learned a whole lot more going through those documents and court paperwork, including an alleged murder confession at stake 44 in Phoenix, a fear of divorce, and a wife that told her friend Larry Rudolph might kill her on the safari trip, but she was going to save her marriage. Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Rudolph, president of SCI. It's week one of the high-profile murder trial for millionaire dentist Larry Rudolph, accused of shooting and killing his wife Bianca Rudolph on a 2016 safari trip in Zambia. Larry told Zambian officials he believed she accidentally shot herself while packing up the gun, and originally the death was ruled accidental. But after the FBI opened the case, they found Larry was having a long-time affair, that his alleged mistress gave Larry an ultimatum to leave Bianca and sell his dental offices, and that Larry cashed out on life insurance payments of nearly $5 million. Court documents are shining more light on what was reportedly happening behind closed doors. According to the paperwork, Larry Rudolph called a personal friend and told him he was afraid of divorce because he couldn't afford to live with what he would have left. The paperwork also says Larry reported his net worth of $27 million. According to statements in the documents from Bianca's friend, Bianca told her friend she was afraid of divorcing Larry because she could not take care of herself and was afraid of losing the kids, that she gave Larry an ultimatum about his affair, and that she knew Larry might try to kill her during the first hunting trip of 2016, but went anyway to try and save her marriage. According to the documents, Larry argues these statements are hearsay. The paperwork also points to something else odd, 
propofol. The court documents show a witness who worked with Larry and his alleged mistress, who was a dental hygienist at his practice, was given unusual and particular instructions for an upcoming special delivery of a vial of propofol, which is a heavy sedation medication. The witness was told to open the package, put the propofol in the back office, and give it to Larry. Their dental practice used outside anesthesiologists at the time and did not keep sedation drugs in its office. Larry came in and picked up the drug, saying he needed it in case there was an accident on the upcoming October hunt. Prosecutors say that shows premeditation for murder, even though Bianca ended up dying by gunshot. Now, court documents show Larry's alleged mistress, Lori Milleron, is being charged with perjury and being an accessory after the fact. That after prosecutors say she lied to a federal grand jury about cash payments made to her by Larry, the nature of her relationship with him, and what was discussed about the FBI investigation between the two. So much to unpack there. The court documents also point to a reported conversation in Stake 44, where Larry allegedly confessed that he killed his wife, Bianca, for Lori. The trial is happening in Colorado because several of the insurers tied to that life insurance payout were based there. Accused of killing his wife while on an African safari, he testified in his own defense today. Royce Jones is here with more on what he said about his wife's death. Royce. Well, Ken, today, Larry Rudolph told the jury that he did not murder his wife and could not murder his wife. His testimony lasted over two hours. Rudolph going into specific details about the inner workings of his open marriage with his wife, Bianca, as well as his personal accounts of what he allegedly witnessed in that Zambian cabin where the shooting occurred back in October 2016. Rudolph claiming that he was in the bathroom when he heard a gunshot go off and came out to find his wife bleeding on the floor. Now, Rudolph is charged with murder and mail fraud in this case because prosecutors think that he killed his wife to get about $5 million in insurance money. Prosecutors also believe that Rudolph wanted to take the money and run off with his girlfriend, Lori Milliron, who's being charged with lying to a grand jury and being an accessory. Well, the defense maintains that there was no financial motive because Rudolph is already rich and that Bianca's death happened accidentally with the gun going off while she was packing. Zambian officials and insurance investigators also deemed the death to be accidental. But then it gets sticky, you guys, because prosecutors argue that the gun was fired from at least three and a half feet away. Ultimately, the trial ended with both of them being found guilty. Larry was found guilty of murdering Bianca and of defrauding multiple life insurance companies. Lori was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact to the murder, obstruction of justice, and two counts of perjury before the grand jury. A guilty verdict for a dentist accused of shooting and killing his wife at the end of a safari in Zambia. Prosecutors say he killed his wife for insurance money and to be with his girlfriend. She's also been found guilty of being an accessory to murder. The trial was in Denver's federal court and lasted three weeks. Larry Rudolph told the jury his wife Bianca shot herself while trying to pack a shotgun at the end of their trip in 2016. Court documents say he was quick to get her body cremated, which investigators found suspicious. Rudolph is from Phoenix. He was charged in Denver because insurance payouts were based in Colorado. The mail fraud charge comes from cashing in on $4.8 million in life insurance claims after his wife died. They are both awaiting sentencing in 2023. A statement from FBI Denver special agent in charge Michael Schneider said, the murder of Bianca Rudolph was not an easy case to investigate and prosecute, but it was the right thing to do to seek justice for this victim, her family, and her friends. Lawrence Rudolph thought he could murder his wife overseas and get away with it. His actions raised red flags, and the FBI was ready to step in to investigate this murder of a U.S. citizen by another U.S. citizen in a foreign country. Larry's dental practice is still up and running, but it's now being run by his daughter, Anna. Now, to me, this entire crime unfortunately happens all too often. You know, a love triangle here, some infidelity there, then poof, these cowards who won't divorce anybody and instead go to the lengths of murder. And also, I think that in addition to just the infidelity and the ultimatum and the affair and all of that, I think that Larry was highly motivated by money. Because remember that alleged crocodile incident or alligator incident or whatever it was, and then he was collecting all of that disability money. Did that ever in fact actually happen? Or is he somebody very similar to, say, an Alex Murdoch who always is after the money? 
and with Bianca gone, not only would he have access to tons of money, but he also would have his sweet little mistress on the side with no repercussions. So I would love to hear all of your thoughts and opinions on this case. What do you think the true motive was here? Do you think that this was planned? Do you think that this was about money? Or was this, in fact, about love? Let me know in the comments below. As I mentioned, sentencing is going to start in 2023, and I, for one, am going to follow very closely because I'm interested to see what the two of them will be sentenced with. I'm also very interested to hear if, at that point, the children will still be sticking by him. So, of course, I will keep you updated as more information becomes available. And guys, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again here. If you're having an affair, whether you're married, you're in a relationship, you're not in love with the person anymore, just grow a sack and get a divorce. You don't need to be going to all these links for murder. And if you're going after it for the money, get a job. Don't be a deadbeat. Like, there are so many different paths that you can take with this. You don't need to go to these links. Like, when will people learn? When will people learn? I don't know, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button on your way out. It's a free way of showing support for the channel and subscribe if you haven't done so already so that you get notified of upcoming case videos as they get posted. And lastly, follow me on Insta. It's um, underscore Annie Elise and I post a lot of behind the scenes true crime stuff over there. So if you're not following along there, make sure you check that out. All right, guys, thanks again. And until the next case, stay safe. Bye.